So we have almost come to the end of the journey of the book of Hebrews and what what an incredibly powerful book this has been. It is filled to the brim with the riches of Jesus for the Christian. The superiority of Jesus is righteousness in every way. He is better than the angels. He is better than Moses. He is better than the law. He is the better once for all sacrifice for sins. We've seen numbers of ways that the author has tried to bring this out. He is the Melchizedekian priest who lives forever. The superiority of Jesus is his main and central cause and concern. He is preaching through this letter to a church that is tempted to turn away from Jesus, young Christians being persecuted, being, being oppressed in some ways, and they're, they're thinking about turning back to the law of Moses, which is the comfortable cultural path for a Jew, and thus failing to obtain the grace that God has offered in Jesus. And God, through his word, wants us as Christians to run the race. We've seen that how, how many weeks now? Run the race with endurance. We're being cheered on by the cloud of witnesses that have come before us. Motivated by the cross. Running after God. Pursuing holiness. Pursuing love. And he's, he's exhorting us to these things. And if there is ever a season of my life where I've needed Hebrews, it's this one. You might feel the same. Because with so many voices in the world trying to tell me to quit believing what I believe, telling me to quit running, not the least of which are the voices of my own sin telling me, you're never going to change. You're never going to make it there. I need a gospel that yanks me forward by grace toward the finish line of heaven. You need a gospel that yanks you forward. You need a gospel that covers your sins. You need a gospel that pardons your transgressions. You need a gospel that frees you from the penalty of your iniquities. And friends, we have that gospel in Jesus. And it is really good, really good news. Can I get an amen from the believers in the room? So why would you ever go back to law-keeping as the basis of your right standing with God. If all I said was true, which is what he's argued for, why would we ever turn back to keeping the law as righteousness before God? Why would we do that? Well, we've come now to Hebrews 12, which is really the the final dramatic scene. Chapter 13 begins to give closing exhortations, sort of like last thoughts before he ends the letter. But this passage here is the, is the pinnacle of the author's argument, which is summing up everything that's been trying to say so far. Why Jesus is better and why you shouldn't ignore him. And he does, he, he tries to drive home this main point by painting this picture for us to imagine. And we're going to paint it here this morning. A picture of two mountains. Imagine that you're in a gully between two mountains. One mountain is right in front of you. The other mountain is directly behind you. These mountains represent Mount Sinai, which is with the giving of the law from Exodus 19. It's the one behind. And Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem, the place of the cross, the work of the gospel. And he wants them and us to remember that they're on a journey from one mountain to the other, from Sinai to Zion, not the other way around going from Sinai, the law, to grace in the gospel. That's what we're going to see now in verse 18, if you'll read with me. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. This is describing Mount Sinai from Exodus 19. After Moses leads the Hebrews out of Egypt toward the promised land, right before he goes up to the mountain. So just imagine the nation of Israel is, 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 is on exodus. They've left. They're marching with their families. They're all this massive group traveling. They trek along like nomads, following the cloud by day and the fire by night. You're in that group and you, 
you make it through the Red Sea, you cross over and Pharaoh's army is swallowed up by the waters and you rejoice, everything's going to be great. You finally arrive at the base of this mountain, you're tired, you're weary from the journey, but you're hopeful for the future. And then this happens, Exodus 19, verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. This is not how pop culture Christianity views God. If he's even there, he's viewed as weak, frail, fragile. I think this description that we've read is anything but that. It's utterly terrifying. Annie Dillard, I think, put it best when she wrote, quote, on the whole, I do not find Christians outside of the catacombs sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Or, as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It is madness to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. For the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. It's hard to, to, to not picture in Exodus 19 something like Mount Doom from Lord of the Rings when you hear a description like this, right? Blazing fire. Sorry for the pixelated picture. Blazing fire. Darkness. Fire and darkness together. Gloom, tempest, sound of a trumpet, a voice that's so terrifying, it makes them beg to stop. They can't hear the voice anymore. See, Mount Sinai was terrified, terrifying because it was engulfed by God's awesome and holy presence. And those who crossed the boundaries that God set up, they were threatened with death, God's judgment. Even if a beast, even if an animal straight off the path and touched the mountain, it would be stoned. It would be destroyed. And so what was seared into the consciousness of Israel is that God is utterly holy and terrifying. We actually get Moses' point of view as he reminds Israel of this moment, of what they experienced when he writes in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Verse 11 through 14, he retells it. And you came near and you stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. Can you imagine? And hear the sound. you heard the sound of the words but saw no form. There was only a voice. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. That is, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone, and the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them in the land that you're going over there to going over to possess. So the author of Hebrews has taken us immediately into the book of Exodus to look at Mount Sinai. Why is he talking about this? What is he getting at here? Why is he bringing us to the foot of Mount Sinai first to look at? Well, if you remember from last week, he had just charged the church to not grow weary in running the race, to not grow weary of running the race of faith and of resisting sin. And we saw last week that God disciplines those who he loves. He's disciplining us, and discipline is painful in the moment, but it's good. It's good. It's good for us. 
It yields a fruit of righteousness. And so we've been encouraged not only to take heart and have courage, but to keep running the race, even when it's hard. Look back up at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. Look at these things we saw last week. He tells us, lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, strive for peace with everyone, strive for holiness, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up, and that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau was, who was so short-sighted that he sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. Now, here's where I need you to pay very close attention. You would think... After charging the church to do these things, you would think that the next thing that he would say would be something like this. For you have come to the mountain of God's terrible holiness, and you will pay the ultimate price if you fail. Because the instinctive response to the justice, the swift justice of violating God's holiness against our sin is terror. You would think that he would, he, would, he would motivate us towards holiness this way by giving more law, by giving more law, by scaring us into obedience, by driving our fear in this way. But it doesn't say that. It actually says the opposite. He gives the exhortations and then he says, to make sure it's absolutely clear to us, for you have not come. I'm exhorting you to live this way for, that's the reason now, for you have not come to Mount Sinai. That's why I'm telling you to live holy because you have not come to Mount Sinai. These Christians are looking to turn back to the law. They're looking to follow the law as a way to be counted righteous before God. This is works-based justification. I will be accepted by God if by what I do. And they're thinking about turning back to the law and leaving Jesus. And he's reminding them in a brilliant way that while the law gives an astonishingly clear clarion call to the fearful holiness of God, it does not, it cannot give the power to not sin and to actually help run the race. Remember, actually, what happens in Exodus, if you know the story. Moses is on the mountain. He's not even back yet with the law before the people look around and they say, hey, we, he's taking too long. We need a God here. And so they throw all their gold into a fire and they fashion up a golden calf. And they say, this is the God that led us out of Egypt. Thus breaking the first commandment of the law they're about to receive, which says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. For you have not come to Mount Sinai. You have not come to this terror. Law cannot keep us from sinning and it cannot make us righteous. It lacks the power to do those things. What law can do and what it does absolutely perfectly is reveal a standard and how far short we are from meeting that standard. Law condemns us. So why would you ever turn back to law-keeping as a way of justifying yourself? Now, it's July 2022, and you're sitting here thinking, I'm not thinking about going back to the law, Pastor Chris. I'm not thinking about, very few of us in the room are thinking about going back to the Mosaic law to justify ourselves, right? I hope. Show of hands if anybody is. If you're tempted to go back to Sabbathing on Saturdays and eating kosher diet and not mixing your fibers and all those kinds of things in the law, but what we are constantly in danger of is manufacturing our own laws, our own mini laws, and then trying to justify ourselves on the basis of those laws. It's one thing to live holy lives and to strive for holiness, but then to try to justify ourselves on the basis of the holiness is basing it on a law that you're trying to keep, even if it's your own law, even if it's the pursuit of a career and You've got certain thoughts in your mind about what makes a successful person. And so those who are in and those who are out, those are righteous and those are not righteous. You might have musical preferences and you polarize into the who's in and who's out group. Oh, you listen to that group. Okay, you're out. And you listen to that band and you're, you're in. Or you turn your convictions about dress and modesty into universal rights and wrongs across the board. 
and then puff your chest out at what you wear, what you don't wear, but only four inches because that's as far as you can go by your law. You turn your view of school education into a mini law. You condemn those who think differently of you. You connect only with those people who think the same as you. We turn our politics into a litmus test for sincere and genuine faith. We castigate our political opponents as being subhuman beings instead of image bearers that maybe we think get it wrong. And we're all producing the same basic legalistic goods and trying to peddle it to our neighbors to get them to buy it as the next big thing. But justifying yourself this way can't work. If you justify yourself because you didn't vote for Biden or because you pulled your kids from public schools or because you never listened to a song from Bethel or because you only wear a one-piece bathing suit in the summer, it's an absolute disaster. Because trying to justify yourself by fulfilling your mini laws according to your self-developed moral code, even if it's in the even if it's in a godly pursuit of holiness, will actually leave you condemned. You can't just be good. You have to be absolutely perfect if you justify yourself by your works. That's why Moses trembled at, with fear at the mountain because the righteous demand of God in the law requires your full and absolute perfect obedience in thought, in motive, in action, in word, and in deed. And you cannot keep that code perfectly. You can't even keep your own code, whatever code it is, perfectly, let alone keeping God's code. And that's why, despite the law being good and righteous, and despite the role it plays in redemptive history to tutor us, to, to point us to Christ, the descriptive metaphor of Mount Sinai here for the Christian is a picture of terror. He says, you have not come to this mountain of terror a blazing fire of darkness, of gloom, a tempest, a trumpet blast, a voice that you just want to go away with such condemning authority that, that you're begging for it to go away. You've not come to the law for righteousness. That's what he's saying. But the law stands in perfect contrast to what we as Christians have in the gospel. John Bunyan famously credited with these words, run, John, run. The law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. See, when you come to the law for righteousness, you're coming to sheer terror, trembling, fear, begging for mercy. But he says, you haven't come to that mountain. You've come to the mountain of joy the mountain of celebration in the gospel, verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is the mountain we have come to as Christians. We've come to Mount Zion, which is a reference to Jerusalem, where the cross happened, where the gospel was, was performed. 2 Samuel verse 5, chapter 5, verse 7, locates Zion at Jerusalem when it says, Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David, which is Jerusalem. But here the, Hebrew, the writer of the Hebrews is not talking about the earthly city, Jerusalem. He's talking of the new Jerusalem that's coming from heaven. See, we have to read the Bible eschatologically. I know that's a big word. It means the last days. We have to read the Bible with the last days in mind. And the eschatological framework that the New, New Testament writers uses is a framework of already and not yet. There are things that have happened already and there are things that have not yet happened. And those are, happening, th th those are true at the same time. There are some end time events that have already happened. For example, the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2 as a, as a fulfillment of prophecy. It's happened. It's already. But it's not yet fully consummated it's a guarantee we read in Ephesians. We know there's more to come. It's a, it's a down payment. 
We're going to have the fullness of the Spirit in heaven. In the same way, look at the way he writes it. He says, you have come to Mount Zion, which means it's already happened in one sense. It's not yet fully consummated, but your membership into the eternal kingdom has begun if you're in Christ. You've already come. You've come to the city of the living God. This is where you are, eschatologically speaking, by having the Holy Spirit. You've come to the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to the place, the city of David. You know when the ark came to, the, came to Jerusalem and David danced like a fool at the presence of God, represented by the ark being in the presence in Jerusalem? We're going to join David dancing like fools for all of eternity in God's presence, in his place, under his rule in the heavenly Jerusalem. And we know that this is going to be a party like no other party. Because in his presence, it says, are innumerable angels. How many, how many is innumerable? You can't count it. Innumerable angels doing what? Festal gathering. That's celebration. These angels are, this is what they've been preparing for, for all, for the, all of the creation. A dazzling sea of angelic glory is awaiting us. Some of these angels may have ministered to saints on earth. And look, there's no talk of doom or fire or tempest or gloom. They're celebrating. There's joy among the angelic chorus. And it's not just angels that are too many to count. Look at the text. It says, we've come to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, which means our fellow believers who are joined to Jesus are waiting for us to join the party. Later in the verse, he calls them the spirits of the righteous made perfect. What a beautiful description of glorification. In this life, the righteous ones live by faith, were counted as righteous, but there will have been made perfect in God's sight. Finally freed from the cursed shackles of our sins, and we're going to be truly free and truly liberated in God's presence. But not just angels and not just the people that have gone before us. All eyes are on God, it says, and to God, the judge. The one who spoke thunder from Mount Sinai and the one to whom all will give an account. Now, I read this and I, I pictured in my mind as I'm thinking about the party theme going on here, I pictured the music stop, stopping and because the cops are coming in to bust up the party. And to God, the judge, music stops, like, you know, show your ID or whatever. But it's not just God, the judge. It's also Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of of Abel. Friends, we can come to the Mount of Zion to join the wedding feast because Jesus gave us a better covenant than the one that demanded perfect obedience from us. He gave us a covenant that was secured by the perfect obedience from him. Not the one that demanded it from us, the one he performed himself to the point of death, even death on a cross where God the judge with all of his thunderous wrath poured out his judgment on Jesus for your sins. That's why we get to be at the feast. All of his holy wrath against his son as justice against our sins. And so where Abel's blood cried out from the ground for justice, Christ's blood cries out pardon, forgiveness, mercy, justified, peace with God. No more law keeping necessary to find hope. We're going to sing these words at the end of the service. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. I know it's hot in here again, but that's just, we're in Arizona and it's July 3rd. It's just the way it goes. But what he's trying to say is, if you want to come to God based on your works through the law, you're going to find terror. If you're going to come to God through the gospel that he's provided in Jesus, you're going to find everlasting joy. And listen, the powerful irony is that this joy in the gospel that flows from our union with Christ is the very basis for our holiness. Strive for peace and the holiness with 
without which you will not see the Lord. It's our motivation for turning away from bitterness and repenting. It's, it's the power to make us want to not be sexually immoral. It doesn't come from the law. The law exposes us. This gives us the power to actually fly. We are not antinomians in the gospel. Nomos is Greek for law. We're not anti-law in the gospel or as Christians, which is grace to do whatever you want to do. We are gospel nomians. Grace that frees us to be slaves to Christ. And so, in proper Hebrews fashion, after setting our, our minds straight again, we get the final warning, verses 25 and through 27. Because of this truth, he says, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. And now I'm going to challenge you in the room. Are you really listening I hope you are. I'm not assuming that you're not. Are you really listening? If God came to your door personally to talk to you, would you ask him to leave his business card and then close the door in his face? Are you really listening? Is your heart actually open to hearing from God, the one who is speaking, his blood speaking about this grace even now? Are you really listening? Because there is a severe warning to you if you've shut your spiritual ears and you're not listening to God. See to it that you don't refuse to hear him. For, keep going in the text, if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens, this phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. This first shaking happened at Sinai, where God warned his people about sin and rebellion. But there is another shaking that is yet to come, one that will take place prophesied by Haggai, one that will not only shake the earth, but will also shake the very heavens. Let me just read Haggai 2. It's going to be on the screen, verses 6 through 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. So God's saying, the first one was a warning shot at Sinai. There's another one coming, significantly higher stakes, and he won't miss. The judgment for not hearing God is looming. And yes, the destruction of the temple in AD 70 served as a judgment against Judaism, but there is a cosmic one that is to come, one that will shake the heavens, all the nations, all the silver, all the gold. God's gathering everything back up to himself. He'll shake the earth. He'll leave us barehanded. And the goal, Hebrews 27 Verse 27, the goal is to strip away all of our self-made idols and to sift our hearts for what will remain. It will be a full shaking. It will be a final shaking. It will be a devastating shaking if you're not in Christ. Will you be counted among the men and women who believe and who will be found standing in the end? And the great news of the gospel is that he's not looking for impressive credentials or you to pad your spiritual resume. Scott Saul writes in his book, Beautiful People Don't Just Happen, quote, the thing that God wants most from you is an admission of your not enoughness. That's what God's looking for. He's shaking us bare, taking the idols away, focusing our hearts on Christ. And then we see our need, our dependency. All that we have is God. And God is all that we need. He's all that we have and all that we need. And he wants to be all. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, wants his death and his spilled blood to be enough for you. And so I have a duty to keep it real with you. If you ignore God, please hear me. If you ignore God, if you play games with God, if you disrespect the cross, if you reject God, you will not escape his judgment when he comes. And if you thought the people on the mountain were begging for his voice to go away, how much more? 
So how should we respond to a message like this, a passage like this? Three, three ways. First, repent. And I mean that by saying repent from your law-keeping attempts to justify yourself. When you assess yourself, what you should see is sinner in need of grace. Sinner in need of Christ. Not a list of accomplishments you've done that makes yourself look good. Repent from law-keeping attempts to justify yourself and return back to the joy of the gospel. If you're not a Christian, today is the day for you to put your faith in Christ and belief. Today is the day to avoid the judgment and escape and to run into Christ and to find forgiveness and peace and pardon from his blood. And if you're a believer, you can fall into the trap of acting like an unbeliever, unbelief. Today is the day to repent. And we're going to take communion together as believers in a moment. Repent from your law-keeping attempts to justify yourselves. I'm not saying repent from seeking holiness. You're empowered to seek holiness. Repent from using your holiness to justify yourself as a means of righteousness. That's first. Second, the text says, is feel gratitude. I hope as this is being preached, you're feeling tons of gratefulness for being counted as a part of this celebration. Therefore, verse 28, let us be grateful, and here's why, for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Everything's going to shake Everything's going to be stripped away, and we're going to have the only thing that isn't going to move. We have Christ. We're in his kingdom. We're his servants. Let us be grateful that we can look to the future with faith, knowing we've got the only immovable thing there is. Our salvation in Christ cannot be stripped away when the mountain shakes again. It cannot be crushed. It cannot be damaged. Therefore, let us be grateful. Let us be grateful for what God has done in salvation. And third, let us offer worship. And thus let us offer to God, verse 28, acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. And, and I, I don't think this is just meaning let's sing a song together, that we're going to sing one more time. Let us offer our very lives as worship knowing that God is a consuming fire. In the end, he is both that holy and that gracious. He is the shaker of mountains and the deliverer of sinners. He is a consuming fire and he is a tender father. He is both. And so don't trifle with such a God and with such a great salvation, but come in and draw near and live by the grace that God gives. Repent. Be grateful and offer your life as worship. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we pray that you would move in us, Lord. Search us. So freeing, Lord, to know that we've not come to the place where the law condemns. Because the law is good and righteous and reveals our devastatingly low holiness. But you sent the one who would keep the law perfectly by faith running his race. His law keeping credited to us as our law keeping so that we could be freed by grace to run. And I pray you would make us run fast and with power, Lord, after you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.